All right, it's good to be with you all today. I uh, used to teach in this part of the country over at Whitworth College, so it's great to be here with uh, folks from K House. Uh, Chuck and I used to get together occasionally when I was a professor there, and it's been nice to be able to renew acquaintance recently as we've been trading recently published books with each other through the mail. Uh, I'm going to talk today about my book uh, called Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. And uh, the lecture today will actually sketch the, the thesis, the argument of that book. Uh, I, I'd like to begin by just uh, putting the debate about intelligent design in some historical context. Last year marked the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. In fact, just a few months ago, it was November 24th, 2009, and the occasion of that uh, anniversary caused a lot of reflection worldwide, especially in the academic world, about the, the legacy of Darwin. What did he teach us? And some, some scientists and some scholars said that he, of course, gave us the idea, the theory of evolution. He gave us the idea of natural selection. But principally, the, 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 the legacy for which he is best known, according to many scholars, is that by giving us the theory of evolution and the idea of natural selection, he refuted the classical argument from design, the idea that nature bears witness to a designing intelligence to, in fact, uh, the, the, as the, the classical medievals put it, the intelligence of God. And, uh, and, and many Darwinian scholars have made this point very, very pointedly. Uh, one is Francisco Ayala, who is a past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He put it this way. He says, the functional design of organisms and their features would seem to argue for the existence of a designer. But it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living or beings can be explained as the result of a purely undirected mechanism, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or any other external agent. Uh, as he put it more succinctly in one of his articles, Darwin gave us design without a designer. Uh, the famous evolutionary biologist from England, uh, Richard Dawkins, who's also a public spokesman for Darwinism all around the world, has expressed the, the same idea. He said that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. If you were all college students, I'd ask you to identify the, the key word in that quotation. It's, it's obviously appearance. That for the Darwinist, uh, things look as though they were designed, they have the appearance of being designed, but that appearance is actually an illusion because there is a purely undirected mechanism that can mimic the powers of a designing intelligence, but which is not in any way guided or directed, and that mechanism is Darwin's mechanism of natural selection. Now, <clears throat> when, when uh, Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, uh, many people don't realize this, but he did not actually attempt to explain the origin of the very first life. What he did was he wanted to explain where all the new appearances of design, if you will, came from across the whole history of life. He presupposed the existence of a first cell, but then wanted to explain how the mechanism of natural selection, his survival of the fittest mechanism, could explain all the new forms of life that had arisen from the very beginning of life until now. So I have on the screen a picture of his famous tree of life diagram. And it, it, it is a representation of what Darwin thought the history of life was like. He thought that if you started way back at the beginning with a simple cell, one-celled organism, and that there was a, a lot of, um, with the mechanism of natural selection acting on all the minute variations that would take place, that they would gradually, that one organism would gradually morph into another and, and produce all the new forms of life we have today. So the branches on his tree represent all the forms of life that we have today, and the, the trunk at the beginning, at the, at the base of the tree, represents the, the life form at the very beginning. And what Darwin attempted to do was to explain away the emergence of all those new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms going all the way back to the, to the very beginning. Now, in the process, he also, and this is where the, the scholarly discussion of his, of his uh, legacy comes in, he also thought that he had explained away all the appearance of design that arose along the way, whether it was the eye of the vertebrates or the coiled nautilus with its beautiful shape or the, the, the three or the four-chambered heart of mammals or reptiles, all these things in biology that look uh, 
so much like they're the product of engineering or forethought or design, he thought that his mechanism of natural selection was capable of, of, uh, of explaining that design away, not as the product of a designing intelligence, but rather as the product of a purely undirected process. Now, why did he think that? Let's just do a little review on that, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll address the question of whether or not he was successful. Well, if you remember, you might, you might imagine that you're a... Uh, 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 well, let's, uh, the 19th century biologists were very impressed with a particular phenomenon that they called adaptation. They noticed that organisms seem to be adapted or well-fitted to their environments. And they thought, and in fact biologists for several hundred years thought, that that evidence of adaptation was an evidence of design. It showed that the designer had made the organisms to live in particular uh, environments. So fish live in water and they have gills and fins. Birds w live in the air, they have wings that enable them to fly and lungs that enable them to process a great amount of oxygen. Um, uh, animals that live in cold climates have very thick fur or wool. Animals that live in, in hot climates can dissipate heat. So that adaptation seemed to indicate design according to biologists until Darwin's time. But Darwin thought that he could explain adaptation as the result not of intentional design, but instead as the result of, of natural selection. And here, here's an example that illustrates his, his, his concept and his insight. Imagine you're a, a, a sheep herder in the, in the far north of Scotland, and you've got a, 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 you're, you're, you want to breed a woollier breed of sheep. What do you do? Well, it's been well known for a long time. It's called artificial selection. Ranchers and farmers could choose certain characteristics in dogs or sheep or pigeons or whatever the, the, the animals were and amplify them by selecting only, for example, the wooliest males and the wooliest females to breed. And then after, if they did that for several generations, they would find that they'd get a woolier, a, a woolier breed of sheep. And what Darwin thought was, well, that's obviously an intelligently designed process, but he proposed a way by which that could happen without any design or guidance at all. And his idea was, well, maybe what he said, what if we had a series of very cold winters such that only the wooliest males and females survived? And what if after uh, the, we winter after winter after winter, there were no intervening hot winters or, or warm winters, mild winters, such that after a while you had the exact same outcome as choosing intentionally only the wooliest. So nature ends up doing what the, in, the breeder, the intelligent breeder does. Nature ends up naturally selecting what had previously been only possible to produce by intelligence. And so natural selection for Darwin became a mechanism that not only was responsible for change, but could also do away with the need to invoke intelligence as a cause for the adaptation that seemed, above all, to bespeak design to biologists prior to, prior to say, 1859. So natural selection replaced the design hypothesis. And that's why scholars today say that's the main legacy of Darwin. But the, the question now today in modern biology is, is that really true? Did he really explain away every appearance of design? And if not, has some other undirected mechanism been able to explain away other appearances of design? Turns out there's a lot of biologists today who are now questioning the creative power of Darwin's mechanism. It's one thing to say, uh, you can get sheep that will maybe will adapt to environment and get a little woolier. You might get some finches in the Galapagos Islands whose beaks get a little longer, a little shorter in response to varying uh, weather conditions. There's the example, the famous example of the peppered moths in England. They get darker, lighter. But can you build moths or sheep or birds in the first place through this mechanism of natural selection? In other words, is it, can it only explain modest... Uh, modest adaptation, or can it explain the origin of the, the fundamentally new forms of life and the big structures that arise during the history of life? Well, that's a big debate, and it's going on right now in, in the technical literature and biology. There is a growing number of scientists who are dissenting from the idea that natural selection has the creative power that was attributed to it by Darwin. But whether or not, whatever side of that debate you fall on, I happen to be a Darwinian skeptic, 
But w- whether you're a skeptic about Darwin's ability to explain away design at that level, at the, at the level of what's called macroevolutionary change, there is a key issue in evolutionary biology, in the history of life, that w- where it's clear that Darwin did not succeed in explaining away design. That is to say, I'm going to, in this lecture, concede, as lawyers say, ad arguendo, for the sake of argument, I'm going to concede the whole of Darwin's theory. I happen to be a, a skeptic of the theory. But w- what I'm trying to point out is that even if you accept Darwin's theory, there is a critical evidence of design that neither he nor anyone else has explained away by reference to natural selection or any other unintelligent, undirected mechanism. And that issue is the origin of the very first life. If you look at Darwin's tree and you look at the base of the tree and focus there, it turns out that there's a critical a critical problem that all evolutionary biologists today acknowledge has been unsolved by, by the, any undirected evolutionary mechanism. And that is the problem, the origin of life. Now, in Darwin's time, scientists didn't worry about this so much. They knew that, they hadn't, they, that Darwin didn't propose a theory for how life began in the first place from simpler non-living chemicals. But they also assumed a view of life that suggested that life wasn't all that complicated and therefore that it didn't really manifest much of an, a, even an appearance of design. The, ni- the 19th century view of the cell was that it was a simple uh, a little glob of jello. That there, we, we knew from, from uh, tel- uh, microscopes at the time that the cell was an enclosure and that there was some kind of chemistry going on in there, but, but scientists at the time assumed that it was very simple chemistry, that with a couple, uh, they actually had a name for the substance they thought was the essence of life. They called it protoplasm. And so one of Darwin's contemporaries, Thomas Huxley, said the cell is a, is a simple homogeneous globule of protoplasm. Or in another place he said a simple homogeneous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. It's just chemical jello. And if you think of life in that way, it's not hard to think about how life might have arisen in a one- or two-step process. You might have a few simple chemicals. They react to form some slightly more complex chemical compounds. They react, and boom, you've got the, the protoplasm. That was the kind of idea that people had about how life must have began, began in the 19th century. Now, I love this quote from Huxley because it makes me feel so smart. This is one of the greatest biologists of the 19th century, and he was completely ignorant of everything that we now know about the complexity, the integrated complexity of the inner workings of life. So let, let's, let's look forward a little bit and, um, and, um, <clears throat> and look at some of the things that have been discovered that have, have completely altered our view of life and completely um, and, and made more difficult this problem of the origin of life. Uh, my grad school supervisor uh, had a quotation in one of, one of her articles about the problem of the origin of life. And she said that at the heart of the problem of the origin of life lies a fundamental question. And that question is, what is it exactly that we're trying to explain the origin of? Awkward phrase, the origin of. But that's, what are we trying to explain the origin of? If you think life is simple, if it's just a simple chemical jello, it's pretty easy to imagine that you could you could uh, produce life in a couple simple chemical steps. But if you think of life as something like a chemical factory run by digital code, which is what we're now beginning to realize, then it becomes much more difficult. And one of the first things that was discovered that began to break down this simplistic concept of life that made scientists think it was so easy to explain its origin was the the discovery of the, the structure of proteins during the 19, 1950s. Uh, and I like to, to make a, use a more pre- precise phrase to describe what was discovered about proteins. We discovered that they were very complex and also that they were very specific or specified. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Let, let's start with some pictures of proteins. Proteins, first of all, are the molecules that do all the important jobs inside cells. They catalyze reactions they build structural parts, they process information, information on DNA, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So they do all the important jobs that keep, the, keep living systems alive. And up until the 1950s, scientists had very simplistic ideas about proteins, just as previously they had very simplistic ideas about the cell. They thought of them as, as like, um, that they would end up being things like 
hat boxes stocked, st- uh, stacked on each other or cigars all stacked like or Lincoln Logs or something like that, that they would be highly regular, very simple structures. The big surprise in the 1950s is that, the, is that they turned out to be highly intricate, three-dimensional shapes, and even more important than that was the discovery that the intricate three-dimensional shapes that proteins have is critical to their function. So I've got a, a slide here of a, of a protein, an enzyme protein, the, the job of which is to break apart a two-part sugar. And you can see that the sugar, which looks on the slide like a little barbell, is, nestles into the shape of the protein that is going to catalyze that breakage. And you can see that there's a beautiful kind of hand-and-glove fit that, that bet- between the enzyme and the, the sugar that enables that chemical reaction to go forward. And that's the case with almost all proteins. They do their job because of a lock key or, or more aptly uh, a kind of hand-and-glove fit where, there's, where one molecule matches spatially the other. And that three-dimensional specificity is the key to the function of the protein. Um, but it, it turns out that that three-dimensional specificity derives from um, a more fundamental one-dimensional specificity, a specificity of arrangement. And I've got a, a visual aid that makes, that makes this clear. This is, uh, this, these are snap lock blocks. Um, what my kids are now teenagers, but I stole these from them when they were about two or four years old, because it said on the box, ages two to four. Um, the, they're, they're colored beads of different shapes. And what I'm using them to do is to illustrate the, the, what proteins are made of. Proteins are made of smaller molecules called amino acids. And there are 20 different amino acids that are part of proteins. And proteins only become proteins. They only acquire those intricate three-dimensional shapes I was talking about when the the amino acids line up in a very specific sequence or order. And then, as a result of their lining up properly, they exert forces on each other and cause the chain to fold into a specific shape. If, it sh- if it's the right shape, the, the, the pro- it will be, it, you will call it a protein because it will do a job. If it doesn't form the right shape, it'll, it'll go limp or it'll form a shape that has no biological relevance. And so what it, it turns out that the arrangement of these amino acids is critical. If I were, for example, to change this blue one here with a yellow one, just rearrange them a little bit, very oftentimes a slight change in sequencing can cause the whole protein to lose its function. And so proteins have a, a property that, that biologists will sometimes refer to as sequence specificity. That means the sequence or the function of the whole depends upon the sequential arrangement of the parts. Now, can you think of anything else that has this property? One of the, the things that first leapt to mind for uh, Francis Crick, who was one of the early molecular biologists in the 1950s, was, was, uh, was informational text. He likened pro, uh, proteins to, uh, and the way that amino acids are, are the, the sequencing of amino acids is critical to the function of proteins, he likened them to the, the, the old type blocks that were used to, uh, uh, to set the headlines of newspapers. That for each amino acid, and we have the, 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 the chemical formulas here, you have... Um, uh, each amino acid has the same kind of um, uh, backbone, but coming out of it, there's a different sticky outie, a different technical term, side chain. And depending on the arrangement of the side chains, you would either have a functional protein or not. Just like the, the fonts on the, the, the type blocks would be sticking out from the blocks, and it's the arrangement of those letters that would determine whether you were conveying information, functional information or not. So... The, the proteins have this property of sequence specificity, and the other things that we know that have that property are things like computer code, uh, English text, and, and other written languages. So, very interesting. It raised a question for scientists who are trying to explain the origin of life. Where does that sequence specificity come from? How do you explain its origin? If proteins are complex and also specified, where did they, how do they acquire those, those unique properties? And just to review the things I just said, th- three key pre- uh, f- features of proteins. One, their shapes are responsible for the, the, the functions they perform. The folded chains of amino acids are what 
uh, create the shapes, and then it's the precise arrangement of amino acids that's responsible for the sequencing or the functioning, or the, and the ultimate, ultimately responsible for function. So the big question for people working on the origin of life it, starting in the 1950s was, how do you explain the origin of these intricate protein molecules, which in many cases are actually functioning much like machines? And, and they have this, the, the, and this intricate three-dimensional specificity and the one-dimensional arrangements. How, how do the amino acids know to get arranged that way? Well, no, almost no sooner had this, this, this question been proposed that there was a kind of a, an important breakthrough. And it came with the work of Watson and Crick in 1953. Um, we learned about the, specific, the specificity of arrangement of proteins and the amino acids in the proteins in 1952. In 1953, Watson and Crick developed... Uh, well, they, they had this great breakthrough in that they elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule. And they discovered that it was this wonderful double helix, and uh, that it, they, they determined that the helix had a very beautiful chemical structure, um, a, what's called a sugar phosphate backbone on the outside of the molecule, and then these chemicals called bases along the interior of the molecule. Now, that was very interesting from the standpoint of the chemistry itself. What's the structure of DNA? They solved that problem. But four years later, Francis Crick came up with what I think is the most important insight in molecular biology, maybe the whole history of biology, and it's called the sequence hypothesis. And what he proposed was that along the spine of the DNA molecule, those four chemicals that are called bases function just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters, zeros and ones, in a machine code. That is to say, it's not the chemistry of those constituents that determines their function. Instead, it's the precise arrangement of those characters that's critical. It's like if you're playing Scrabble and you've got a pile of letters next to the board, those letters are, are, uh, you know, those letters are and, the, and the, the physical properties of them are insignificant until you arrange them properly to, so you can get that triple word score. It doesn't matter whether the letters are made of of wood or plastic or, or whether they were ink or whatever, it's, it's the arrangement that enables them to perform a function. And this was, this was a key breakthrough. And now what, I, what I'd like to show is what that information inscribed along the spine of the DNA molecule does. This is an animation clip of the DNA, and we're going to see that it's critically important to building the proteins that we've just been talking about. Um, this is a big protein complex called a polymerase, and it attaches to the, the DNA molecule. And it makes a copy of the original instructions that we were seeing on the DNA. And now we're going to see, we see on the inside of the polymerase that copy being built as, one, as these letters in the genetic alphabet, the bases, one by one are positioned along the, the, the strand of the DNA. And we get a copy then that's spit out. And whereas DNA has two strands, this copy is a one-stranded molecule called a messenger RNA. It has all the instructions from the DNA molecule, and now we're going to see what those instructions do inside the cell. First, they're going to pass through a really interesting molecular machine that controls the traffic inside and outside of the nucleus of the cell. And once that transcript is passed through, it's going to go to a two-part chemical factory called a ribosome. And what we're going to see now is that the ribosome is a kind of chemical factory where proteins are constructed in accord with the information on the messenger transcript, this RNA molecule. The, the message is on the top, and we'll see, we're seeing uh, little adapter molecules that come in that have um, three letters that match up the, the letters on the, on the uh, message, and they bring in one by one in a very mechanical way amino acids that correspond to the, the, the information that's inscribed on the, on the, on the messenger transcript. So depending on the arrangement of those base letters, you'll get a different amino acid linking in one by one by one. And so they're actually literally dictating how the cell builds the proteins out of the 20 different amino acids that are possible. And then we've seen here in the animation that that protein will come off it will eventually fold into a beautiful three-dimensional shape, and, and then it will be released into the outer part of the cell to go do the job it does in the cytoplasm.
Okay? So this is a, a, an intricate mechanical process, but it's all being driven by the information on the DNA molecule, which is copied and then carried out to a place where it can direct the manufacturing of the proteins and protein parts. I like to li liken this process to something that we're, we're increasingly familiar with in the engineering world. It's a, a technology called CAD-CAM, Computer Assisted Design and Engineering. I'm from Seattle, and if you go to the Boeing plant in Seattle, you will find engineers using digital information to direct the construction of mechanical parts. Uh, an engineer will sit at a console, will make some selections of parameters. Those parameters will be literally codified into digital code. They'll be sent down a wire, translated into another form of code that can be read by a manufacturing uh, um, center, and then that information will direct, for example, the placement of, of rivets onto an airplane wing or something. So we're very familiar with the kind of technology that we found at work inside the cell. It's digital technology directing manufacturing. Now, all of this has raised a very great mystery, and I like to call this mystery the, the DNA enigma. Uh, we now know, thanks to Watson and Crick, the structure of the DNA molecule. We also know that the DNA molecule encodes information in a digital form. Those A's, C's, T's, and G's that chemists use to represent the different bases, as they're called, are sequentially arranged to direct the construction of proteins. So we know the structure of the DNA molecule. We know that it contains information. We know even what the information does. That's what the animation was just showing. But there's a big mystery surrounding that information, the information in DNA. Any guesses? It's the mystery of the origin of the information. It's not what it does. It's not where it resides. We know where the hereditary information resides, or at least much of it is along the spine of the DNA molecule. We know the structure of DNA, but what has become in an increasingly acute mystery in the field of evolutionary biology or, or a subdiscipline of that that's sometimes called uh, origin of life research is the question of where did the information come from? Now, I first encountered this mystery in 1985. I was a young scientist. I was in a, working in geophysics. My job was uh, to look for oil. Uh, my boss was a Texan, and he said, your job is to look for all out in the Gulf. The Gulf was the Gulf of Mexico, and oil is all is actually the Texas way of saying O-I-L. And, uh, but I was doing, uh, 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 using an early information-based technology called digital signal processing, and, uh, and so I became very interested in the whole question of information. And I later attended a conference where I discovered that the mystery of information in DNA was at the heart of that mystery that Darwin had never solved, the mystery of the origin of life in the very first place. And so I got very interested in this. And one scientist put it this way. He said that the problem of the origin of life is basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information. I used to ask my, my, my college students a question, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And they would know the answer is obvious. You have to give it code. You have to give it software. Well, it turns out that the same thing is true in life. If you want to, give, uh, if you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form, you have to have, at the very least, a whole new suite of proteins, which requires a whole lot of information encoded in DNA in order to build those proteins. If you want to build life in the first place, just a simple little cell, you've got to have proteins, and that means you've got to have the information in the DNA molecule to build those proteins. And that, become, that, that has become the fundamental question uh, that scientists are facing as they're attempting to explain the origin of life. Where did that information come from? If we could explain the origin of the information, then maybe we could explain the origin of life. Now, I'm just tying back to the original theme that I struck about Darwin's legacy. Remember I said that Darwin's legacy was that he had, according to his, his, his uh, chief proponents today, that he explained away the appearance of design without invoking an actual designing intelligence. He refuted the design argument. But here we have, with the digital code in DNA, a critically important appearance of design that has not been explained away by any undirected ex uh, mechanism such as natural selection. Um, and here's Richard Dawkins making this point, although uh, 
not wanting to fully acknowledge it, I guess. What he says is that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Apart from differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. We're looking at digital code. So that's a striking appearance of design. Why is that an appearance of design? Well, because when we find digital code today, it's typically the result of a programmer, of a designing intelligence. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, our local hero in Seattle, has said that DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've, we've ever devised. 